Hey guys, hope everybody had a good weekend. So, when people begin the fight against male pattern baldness, oftentimes they'll talk to their doctors, and what their doctors will usually recommend as the first line of defense is finasteride. They do this because finasteride is the only FDA-approved treatment that has been shown to treat the underlying cause of hair loss in men with androgenic alopecia, which is DHT, dehydrotestosterone in the scalp. Minoxidil was the first FDA-approved treatment for hair loss, but it is a growth stimulant. It has no influence on androgens whatsoever. Finasteride, on the other hand, works by stopping the conversion of testosterone into DHT via the suppression of the 5A reductase pathway, and as such, ends up reducing DHT on the scalp by approximately 60% or so. Clinical studies on the drug show it is well tolerated, has a low risk of side effects, and works well even long term, with 60% of patients having lost no ground even after over five years of usage. Finasteride is often used in combination with topical minoxidil as a combination therapy as it's been proven that finasteride plus minoxidil works better than finasteride alone, but even as a standalone treatment, finasteride has, proved, has been proven effective. Now, what is especially great about finasteride is not just the fact that it is safe and it works well, but it is also very easy to adhere to as all you have to do is pop a pill. Hair loss is a long-term battle, so applying topicals daily can be inconvenient, and it could be aesthetically displeasing as many topicals are ethanol-based, which could initially give the hair a greasy look and then make it look dried out and lifeless later on. Now, this can be countered to an extent with the use of quality conditioners and oils like jojoba oil, but many people do not want to be bothered with this and rather just take a pill and be done with it for the rest of the day. Now, as wonderful of a treatment as oral finasteride is, there are still a few people who do not respond well to the drug. In rare instances, a small number of people can develop sexual or neurological side effects. Now, I think many people who say they have side effects are just imagining it due to the nocebo effect they give themselves after reading all the misinformation and fear-mongering about the drug online, but like any drug, there is a risk of side effects. There are also people who wonder if the oral route of administering finasteride is ideal. After all, finasteride is a drug that was initially approved for benign prostatic hyperplasia, and it does this by systemically inhibiting the type 2 5A reductase enzyme, which is most active on the scalp and the prostate. If you are just a hair loss sufferer, though, then you probably aren't worried about your prostate, and you may think applying finasteride directly to the problem area is a more effective means of combating, uh, of combating hair loss. Women have also looked at the use of topical finasteride to treat female pattern baldness as oral finasteride is not appropriate due to its risk of causing birth defects in premenopausal women. Fortunately, uh, there is a good deal of research on this, which we'll get into, but before I do that, I would like to go over my own personal history with topical finasteride. Now, the first time I used finasteride, it actually was in a topical formulation via a solution called Promox. When I had started Promox, I had already been on minoxidil for over two years, but I had started to lose ground since minoxidil is not an effective long-term treatment for androgenic alopecia. Now, what Promox is exactly is a topical cream that has 15% minoxidil, uh, 0.1 finasteride, and it also has uh, progesterone in it, which has uh, limited research, but it's been shown it could possibly have some 5A reductase inhibiting effects as well. Now, Promox, Promox required a prescription, and as far as I know, it is no longer available as the doctor who compounded it sadly died, although there are other topical finasteride solutions on the market. Problem is, is that uh, these topical solutions are not FDA approved, so the FDA has the tendency to crack down on them, so it's uh, difficult to source them reliably. Um, the FDA did this with Dr. Lee. He was a doctor who sold a bunch of hair loss products in the early 2000s. So, like I said, oftentimes these topical finasteride solutions are not easy to source and they're not reliable to source since you never know when they uh, may be taken off the market for a while. So, they can also be purchased through uh, chemical research websites like the Polychem Solution, which is uh, kind of a gray market area though, so I have to be careful about recommending it for personal use in that context. Now, Promox did work for me as it halted the hair loss I was starting to experience after being on monotherapy with minoxidil, but I found that Promox was difficult to source as supplies were often short and it was very expensive. I'm talking like $200 a, uh, for a month supply. And the fact that I responded well to treatment was one of the things that helped me build the courage to try oral finasteride. So eventually, instead of using Promox, I just dropped that and I got a prescription for Proscar instead. And Proscar, as you guys probably know, is the 
5 milligram variant of finasteride, uh, which I quarter into 1.25 milligrams. And that is what I have been doing for over 10 years now. And since that time, I have had no adverse side effects and the drug has been the most effective weapon in my arsenal against hair loss uh, by far. Now, nevertheless, topical finasteride has remained a subject of interest for me. And it is a subject of curiosity for many of those who are either looking to begin their fight against hair loss or they are currently fighting it and are examining its role as an effective treatment for hair loss, either as a standalone treatment or as an adjunct treatment. So what I wanted to do is examine a paper published in 2018 that reviews seven studies done on the subject of topical finasteride. So let's go ahead and take a look at this review. Let's see if these are quality studies and see how the results compare with what we know about oral finasteride. So the authors quote one animal study in mice of topical finasteride that showed promising results, but the other seven studies are all in vivo, meaning they were performed on actual human beings. So that's a good start as getting results in a lab rat doesn't always establish good outcome data when it comes to treating uh, treatments designed for human beings. So I'm going to just look at the in vivo studies and I'm going to ignore the animal study because I think in vivo outcome data uh, from human beings is obviously going to be more effective than like a lab rat study. So the first study reviewed included 52 total uh, subjects, 28 of who were men and 24 who were women, all aged between 18 and 38 years old. This was interesting because finasteride has not been studied extensively in women, and here we have an almost equal population sizes between both groups. It was a randomized control trial, meaning patients were randomly assigned to treatment or placebo, and the study was conducted over a 16-month period. The treatment group were given 0.005% topical finasteride, which is a very small dose, even by the standards of topical finasteride. And after six months of treatment, 73% of people in the treatment group reported slight to significant reduction in the balding areas compared to where they were before they began treatment. 30% of the placebo group ended up quitting because it wasn't working, and the other 70% reported either no or slight regrowth, which could just be a placebo effect. Uh, this was the first, as far as I know, this was the first human study of topical finasteride. It was published in 1997. And in summary, it showed a significant effect of topical finasteride, even at this low dosage. And to give you a comparison, most topical finasteride solutions available on the market or from chemical research websites today are at 0.1%. However, this study was not adequate to assess safety, especially in women. And indeed, all the subsequent studies reviewed do not include women. So looking at the next study. This one was performed in 2009, which is a big jump in time. And this one had a smaller sample size. And like I said, it didn't include any women, just 38 men in a randomized control trial. And all men in this randomized control trial were in their early 20s. So in this one, they directly compared topical finasteride at 1% to oral finasteride at one milligram, which is the FDA approved dosage for finasteride at treating hair loss. They compared both treatments to placebo. So the researchers in this study examined the size of the bald area and the total hair count and terminal hair count. To explain what the terminal hairs are, those are the long, thick hairs, as opposed to the vellus hairs, which are thinner and they're sometimes transparent. So all the treatment groups, which includes the people on oral and the people on 1% uh, uh, topical finasteride, experienced a significant increase in hair count after just four months of treatment, as well as a reduction in the size of the bald area of their scalp, uh, which pretty much means the same thing. So the study was conducted uh, fairly short term. It was just six months total. But overall, there was no major difference between oral and topical finasteride compared to placebo. So this study suggests topical works as well as oral finasteride. Granted, this was a very high dosage of topical finasteride that they were using. I mean, you probably wouldn't be able to find something like this on the market today, uh, and you'd probably need a chemist to compound it for you if you're interested in trying it at that high of a dose. So looking at the adverse effects in the study, however, one person did have erythema, which is redness of the scalp from the topical, although this could have been due to the vehicle of the topical as opposed to the actual active ingredient finasteride. And also 1% reported decre decreased libido with oral finasteride, which out of 38 people isn't bad and reflects the current research on finasteride side effects. So the next study had an even smaller sample size of people, uh, 15 subjects, all men ranging in ages from 24 to 72 years old, 
Uh, so this time it included a wider age group. This one, however, was not a randomized control trial, but rather it was a prospective uh, cohort. What this means is that the effects of the drug were compared to baseline in each patient. What is interesting about the treatment in this study is that the treatment group was given a solution that includes both topical finasteride and topical dutasteride, and they gave the subjects the options of using other hair loss treatments, including oral finasteride, topical minoxidil, as well as a ketoconazole shampoo over a period of nine months. Assessments were made using photographs, and unsurprisingly, everybody in the group experienced significant growth, uh, some in as few as just 30 days with no adverse side effects. So obviously the problem with the study is that there were so many therapies involved, and since they weren't applied consistently, we can't determine which one of these was the most responsible or at all responsible for the results the subjects experience. So this is a bad study, and the chances we can yield quality data from it are lower than the chances of Jason Blaha seeing a vagina in real life. So fortunately, the next study is a randomized control trial from 2012, and it involved 33 male subjects uh, from the ages of 27 to 49 years old. The treatment groups were given either a 3% topical monopoly Minoxidil solution or a 3% topical minoxidil solution combined with a 0.1% finasteride uh, solution over a period of 24 weeks. They measured hair growth with photographs, and the results showed promising, promising results for topical finasteride, as even though both groups did get improvement compared to baseline, the group using the combination therapy of minoxidil 3% plus 0.1% finasteride showed significantly higher efficacy than just 3% minoxidil alone. Both groups experienced similar adverse side effects, namely contact dermatitis, but again, this may have had more to do with the vehicle as opposed to the active ingredient. The only real flaw with this study, though, uh, was that it just had a small sample size, but what data is there does suggest that topical finasteride does indeed work. So now we're getting into very a, a very interesting study because this is the first one which compares topical finasteride to oral finasteride. This study is another randomized control trial that involves 23 male patients between the ages of 18 to 65, so it's a small but diverse group in terms of ages at least, and one group was given topical finasteride at 0.25% twice daily. So that's a pretty high dose, and it was uh, compared to one milligram of finasteride, which, of, which is, of course, the standard FDA-approved dose uh, for uh, treating hair loss in men. The criteria of the study was different from the others, however. Rather than look at hair growth or cessation of hair loss, what they wanted to do was see the effect these treatments had on plasma dehydrotestosterone levels, which is important if people are opting for topical finasteride on the premise that it has a reduced systemic absorption. The study was conducted over a course of seven days, and the results showed surprisingly that there was not a big difference in systemic effects between oral and topical finasteride. Plasma DHT levels with topical finasteride were reduced by 68 to 75%, and with oral finasteride, it was reduced by 62 to 72%. So the difference between the two groups isn't significant, but it's quite notable that the topical finasteride actually reduced plasma DHT levels by larger numbers. This is good news and bad news because on one hand, it shows that topical finasteride should work much like oral finasteride, but on the other hand, if you're still going to get systemic absorption, then what the hell is the point? This doesn't necessarily indicate a greater likelihood of side effects as the mechanism behind finasteride sides are not fully understood. So we don't know if it's as simple as lower DHT equals sides, but if topical finasteride is still ca is causing systemic absorption, then we can assume the same issues people have with oral finasteride finasteride they will also likely have with topical finasteride. There were no side effects reported in the study, but it was conducted over a short period of time, just seven days, so further research is needed, I think, to confirm that. It's possible the systemic absorption may have something to do with the high concentration of topical finasteride that was used in the study, which is, of course, of course, twice daily compared to the standard dose of oral finasteride, but that's one of the good things about oral finasteride is that there is, in fact, a standard dose. We don't have as much data on topical finasteride finasteride and we don't know what the standard dose is or what it should be, what's most effective and what's most safe. And for that reason, many people may not want to turn themselves into lab rats experimenting with what they think may work best when we already have something that we know works. So let's move on to the next study, which measures serum DHT, but also looks at scalp DHT, which is important because it's the scalp DHT, which is in fact wrecking havoc on our hair follicles after all. This is another randomized control trial, but this one had more subjects, 50 to be precise, who were also aged between 18 to 65 years old. Um, 
There were two phases to the study. The first compared 0.25% topical finasteride given once daily compared to the same amount given twice daily. And it also compared it to one milligram of oral finasteride daily over a course of seven days, like in the last study. And the second phase compared topical finasteride at 0.25% twice daily in various quantities ranging from 100 microliters all the way up to 400 microliters versus placebo over seven days. So like I said before, uh, the study measured both plasma and scalp THT. So in the first phase, the group that got one milliliter of topical finasteride at 0.25% experienced a 70% decrease in scalp THT compared to a 50% decrease in people using it twice daily or in people using oral finasteride. So how does this make sense? It doesn't make sense. What this shows is that this study shows a result which likely happened by chance. And that is why when drugs are undergoing FDA approval, they have multiple clinical trials to test the reliability of previous studies. This is important because people have the tendency to latch onto data from one single study when we really need more data than that to draw conclusions from. So looking at the second part of the study, which used different dosages, it showed that scalp DHT wasn't really dose dependent, meaning the small dose still resulted in about a 50% decrease in scalp DHT, but using greater quantities would only cause serum DHT to lower. So what this implies to me is that using a lower dose of topical finasteride may have the same effect uh, on the scalp as a higher dose without causing as much systemic, uh, systemic absorption that could lead to side effects. So Looking at the last study in this review, uh, this one was performed the most recently in 2017, and it's both a retrospective and prospective study of 50 male subjects between the ages of 20 to 40. And all the stu subjects started off on 5% minoxidil and one milligram of oral finasteride over a course of two years. That's the retrospective part. After two years, they switched to minoxidil 5% plus topical finasteride at 0.1% of daily use for one year. So what we should look for is if if they maintained, lost ground, or possibly had even better results after they switched. The results were assessed by a photograph, and what they showed is that 84.4% of patients maintained their hair density, while the remaining patients presumably lost ground. Nobody showed any improvement, but that's probably because they were already on good treatment to begin with. Now, I guess what this implies is that someone can most likely switch from oral to topical finasteride and have a very good chance of maintaining their gains, which is good news if somebody can't use oral finasteride. Although in this study, nobody experienced any adverse effects whatsoever, which further demonstrates the fact that side effects are very rare with finasterides. So looking at the data of all these studies, even if we're going to assume that they're all accurate and none of the results were by chance, we can see that topical finasteride has similar effects to oral finasteride in terms of suppressing scalp DHT and that using higher concentrations of topical finasteride isn't necessarily better as it's been shown to just suppress more serum DHT. So while this is all fine and interesting, there really isn't enough strong evidence to support the notion that topical finasteride works any better or has a reduced risk of sides compared to oral finasteride. And the fact that it has systemic absorption certainly makes it inappropriate for women, which is why doctors will advise men to make sure their partners do not even handle the finasteride tablets due to their risk of causing birth defects in premenopausal women. Now, I have nothing against people trying new things, but they should not try topical finasteride thinking it's going to spare them from potential side effects. The evidence is just not there, and if you're really worried about the side effects that much, then you probably shouldn't take finasteride to begin with because you'll just give yourself a nocebo effect. The FDA-approved treatment for finasteride is oral finasteride. It's oral finasteride because that is what has the most data behind it. We know it works. We know it has a low risk of side effects and we know that there is no chance that the data can be dismissed as chance because there are enough subsequent studies to confirm the reliability of the older studies. So if you want to use finasteride, you might as well just use what has the most data backing its efficacy rather than trusting your hair to theory. Now, don't take this as medical advice, but if I were to conclude anything from these studies, it's probably that the best concentration for topical finasteride is 0.1%. That is the concentration I use when I use Promox and that seems to be the sticking point between achieving scalp DHT suppression without additional uh, serum DHT suppression. So if someone wants to try it, that is what I would recommend. But of course, you should speak to your doctor first. You can get pre-made solution 
solutions or you can uh, compound it with Proscar tablets in an ethanol based solution like stamoxetine, fluoridyl or alpha trial. But again, what the hell is the point of topical finasteride if it doesn't work any better and still has systemic absorption? I mean, just use oral finasteride for Pete's sakes. The chances that oral finasteride will not work for you after all are very, very low. And oftentimes people who say it isn't working are people who have not given the drug enough time. I mean, you really should give it about six to 10 months minimum. And it also includes people who get an initial shed from treatment and then panic and think it's not working. I mean, freaking out over the initial shed is by far the most common mistake people make. I mean, don't freak out. It's normal. It's nothing to be alarmed about and it stabilizes on its own. You've just got to be patient. So anyways, that's all I wanted to say about the subject, but I'll have more to say on finasteride and other hair loss treatments in the future. Until then, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.